America, and welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. On yesterday's program, you can watch it, just download it. It is uh, available online right now, but you don't need to see part one to really understand part two. Let me tell you that we are causing our own problems, and I, I want to show you how this whole thing, until we spit ourselves out of this game, we're not going to fix anything. And it's the blame game. We are blaming everything now. Corporations, guns, banks, Wall Street, politicians, political parties. It's Mexico, it's China, cops, higher education. Old statues are now to blame. We blame absolutely everything. And let me show you how this, how this works um, when we start to blame how, it, how it's supposed to work and what's actually happening. Right now, there will be a tragic event that happens. And the way it should work is there's a tragic event and somebody says, man, we should do something. Uh, we got to stop this. And then the media reflects this and the conversation that's happening in D.C., you know, a listening tour or whatever. And the government, uh, you know, gives the solution. That's the way it used to work. I'm not saying that's the best way because I don't believe in government solutions. But now what's happening is while the tragic event is happening the media and others, I don't know why this chalk won't work, the media and others assign blame right here. Sometimes while it's happening, then they focus on everybody saying, we've got to do something because whoever is to blame. Then the media and DC focus on that blame. They go on a listening tour so they can make sure everybody in the country knows who's to blame which gives them the solution to protect you. But who actually gets the blame? Who actually... It's never the person or persons or group that you think gets the blame. Somebody pays the price, and I contend it is always you. Always. On both sides of the aisle. Let me show you how this works. Each one of these have... This is the Bill of Rights. And everything here has been violated over and over and over again because we've got to do something. Bill of Rights, just a real quick recap. These are not promises that, hey, by the way, uh, the government, you know, we're going to give you these rights. This is, this is a contract that's, that handcuffs the government. You can never, ever do these things. Let me show you what they're doing. First Amendment, of course, is freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of petition. Now, we've heard what President Trump has been saying regarding the press, but the last two administrations before him went far beyond mere words. Do you remember when U.S. Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald, under the Bush administration, used subpoenas and threats to pressure reporters to give up their sources regarding the Valerie Plame scandal? Fast, flash forward just a few years. You have President Obama. He took that standard by the Bush uh, White House and doubled down. Here's Fox News' Washington correspondent James Rosen describing what he endured at the hands of the Obama administration. The Attorney General Eric Holder, under Barack Obama as president, uh, secretly designated me a criminal co-conspirator and a flight risk, uh, and thereby had a federal judge give the government permission to rifle through all my Gmails. Uh, they could read the emails, and then also to get all the phone records associated with about 20 phones that I used at that time in my reporting. And because at that time, the press was on the side of the president. They didn't really care about that. They cared about it with Bush, and they care about it now. We need to care about it all the time. The Obama administration, in secret, designated Rosen as a criminal co-conspirator. They used that to spy on the press. Now, you make the call. Is freedom of the press under attack, yes or no? I'd, I would contend that it's not only under attack, it's in danger of being overrun in an all-out rout. Freedom of speech... You have a right to have speech. Have you seen what's happening at co college campuses lately? If you're a conservative voice, if you aren't turned away altogether, your mere presence turns the grounds into an all-out war zone. 
As for assembly, I'd argue that the Obama administration's use of the IRS to target the Tea Party was a direct assault on the First Amendment's protection of op- opposition voices and the freedom to assemble and petition. And religion? Nuns actually had to go to the Supreme Court to plead with the government not to force them to hand out private co- uh, contraception. Nuns. Private businesses were forced to compromise their faith over the serious issues that they felt were essential to their salvation. The First Amendment is slowly getting whittled down line by line, and there's not going to be anything left. Who's to blame here? Is it the press? Is it the crazy religion? Is it the people who have hate speech? Is it the people who are going to... Who's being hurt by this? Now, let's move to the second Right to bear arms, never been in more danger. It's impossible to miss the almost daily calls for gun confiscation or even amendments to, to outright abolish the Second Amendment. But many people haven't heard about the full scope of what has already happened under the Bush administration in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Watch. They say there are no orders to use force, just strong persuasion, sometimes entering open houses with guns drawn and instructions to disarm anyone inside. You say guns, guns will be taken? Yeah, no one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all yes, weapons. Sir. Take all arms. We will take all weapons. I'm sorry, but you can't do that. Not only did the government trample all over the Second Amendment, but listen to this, uh, the same news report. Listen to this. For many of the police and guard troops, it is an uncomfortable job to do this in an American city. This guard unit occupied a church, using it as a base camp. They had to leave a note because they could not get hold of the pastor to get permission. It is, it is surreal. Yeah, you just never, you never expect to do this in your own country. Never expect to do, it's uncomfortable for them? I wonder why. Maybe because this is a violation of the Second Amendment and now the Third Amendment. Quartering of soldiers outside of war. It is absolutely illegal. The Third Amendment has been delegated to joke status. It's called the Forgotten Right. But it was completely trampled on during a modern era in this media report. They never even mentioned the Bill of Rights. The U.S. government committed two federal crimes, but apparently that's not newsworthy. They had to. We have to do something. And so what do we do? For your protection, we violate this. The Fourth Amendment protects us from unreasonable seizures, uh, search, searches and seizures. It requires warrants and probable cause. That's really clear. It says no violation in the amendment. Jeff Sessions just justified civil asset forfeiture. Here's our current attorney general in his own words. Watch. I love that program. We had so much fun doing that, taking drug dealers' money and <laughs> passing it out to people trying to put drug dealers in jail. What's wrong with that? The Fourth Amendment is wrong with that. That program is, is unconstitutional. You cannot seize property from people who are suspected of committing a crime, even without an indictment. I don't care how fun you think it is. It is a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. What if someone accused you and your family of a crime you didn't commit? It was all based off circumstantial evidence. Just on mere speculation, you could have your bank account drained, your car seized, the the family home taken away from you, and many of the people who have had this wrongly done to them have a considerably hard time getting their property back. Why? Well... Because as the inspector general has just said, law enforcement agencies were using that money they seized to bolster their budgets. And on top of that, in some cases, indictments were never even filed. This is why we wrote all of these things. We, the, the founders knew the king was sending people in, quartering soldiers in and spying on them, and then just going through their papers and their property, and, and they, they didn't have to have a warrant. I contend the Third Amendment is also being, um, is being violated by the NSA. This was written because the king was sending people in to spy on people in their own home. 
So, why did we violate that? Well, we violated those, well, because there was a hurricane, so we had to get rid of the guns, and we had to quarter soldiers there, and we can take the uh, papers and the property and everything else. We can do that without a warrant. We can do that because we got to stop you from evil drugs. Something's got to be done. We're only at four amendments, and so far, we can identify violations spread between multiple administrations. Every single one. We pick up with number five through ten next. I remember the first time in my life when I stopped and considered the real value of the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment, protection of life, liberty, property, due process, right to remain silent, double jeopardy, indictments, and just compensation for property. I remember this happened in the 90s. It actually involved our current president, but long before he considered running for office. It was the mid-1990s, and he was looking to expand his real estate empire in Atlantic City. Atlantic City needed jobs. 22-story Trump Plaza, going to be the crown jewel of the boardwalk, a casino that overshadowed all the other casinos. He just had one problem. The property lacked adequate space to park limousines that would no doubt be flooding into the casino. What do you do? we got to do something because we need jobs, said Atlantic City. The adjacent home next to the casino was the obvious spot for a parking lot, so Trump went to work on a charm offensive and tried to convince the homeowner, her name was Vera Koking, to sell her property. Well, his charm offensive failed. Koking had raised her kids in the home that she was living in, and she said, I'm not selling it. Undeterred, Trump then went right to the government to claim imminent domain. That is, something's got to be done. I'm going to be much better for the community and the collective than this individual. And so she tried to steal her home from, from underneath her. He lost in court. But then shortly after that, there was another case in New England. Pfizer needed to build a big plant, create jobs. We have unemployment. We've got to do something. Pfizer won, took all the houses, and then never built the plant. If Koking wouldn't have had a good lawyer, the government would have seized her property. The Fifth Amendment states, no one shall be deprived of life or liberty or property without due process. Now, how does a private businessman's abuse of government imminent domain program reconcile with the Fifth Amendment. It doesn't. I don't care who you are. Pfizer? No. No. In 2002, you remember the name Jose Padilla, U.S. citizen. U.S. citizen. He was arrested in Chicago. He was suspected of planning, planning a dirty bomb attack and being linked to a terror group. For over a month, he was detained without access to lawyers as a material witness. President Bush had designated him an enemy combatant. He argued he wasn't entitled to a trial in civilian courts. He was then transferred to a military prison, again, with no access to lawyers, for three and a half years. He was a U.S. citizen. But I know, but the country is under attack. We have to do something. After intense pressure from civil liberty groups, Padilla was later transferred to a civilian jail. In 2007, he was finally convicted by a federal grand jury of conspiracy and funding terrorism, but he was not convicted of the crime which he was originally arrested for. Now think of this. Padilla spent multiple years in prison without access to an attorney, without being charged or convicted with a, of a crime. Was he a bad guy? Yes, he was. But he was also an American citizen. Do we protect everybody under the Fifth Amendment? Or in a time of crisis, that all goes out the window. We've allowed this to happen. And it's going to happen more and more frequently because national security, it's, an, it's, a, it's a national emergency, it's, it's, a, it's a crisis of some sort. There are reasons, very good reasons, why we place limitations on what government can and cannot do. What if Padilla was you? And it was a tragic mistake. Imagine if you had been wrongly accused of aiding and abetting a terrorist. Maybe you were a banker. You unwittingly helped a terror organization move funds. But you didn't know that. Under the Padilla standard, you're going to be declared an enemy combatant. You would be in prison without access to an attorney for three years. This is what we've opened ourselves up to because we've got to do something. 
Islamic terrorism is to blame. We've got to do something. What about all of the talk of gun confiscation lately? If you're one of those who are calling for it, be careful what you're wishing for. Because you obviously don't care about the Second Amendment, but taking someone's property without due process just happens to be an infringement of the Fifth Amendment as well. So we have both of them gone. The Sixth Amendment is a right to a public trial, and which I think is funny nowadays. I mean, it seems like right now the right to a public trial is morphed into trial by public. Accusation now equals guilt in the court of public opinion. Sixth Amendment also guarantees the accused a right to be informed of what the nature and the cause of the accusation is. And then to be able to confront the witness and have witnesses come up against it. We're not doing that. We didn't do that with Padilla. And college campuses are beginning to violate this one all over the country. In 2012, Brian Harris was accused of sexual assault and expelled from St. Joseph's University. He later sued, claiming the university, as per the Sixth Amendment, failed to provide him with a fair trial. The university was forced to settle out of court, but case after case, just like this, popping up all over the place. The Seventh Amendment, civil case right to a jury, This one's been given a bad rap because frivolous lawsuits. You know, like the guy who sues every time he's in a car crash, walks around, oh my gosh, and he doesn't need the neck brace, and then he wasn't hurt. But what about the doctor? A doctor who commits malpractice on you, and you're left with medical expenses that you could never possibly keep up with. The Seventh Amendment allows you to sue the doctor so you can pay for his mistakes. I might get in trouble for saying this. I think I have an arbitration clause, and I think we put arbitration clauses in our contracts here. Do you have an arbitration clause with your employer? Watchdog Group from Public Citizen found 75% of companies like banking and construction use them in all of their contracts. You bought a car, you you signed one, which means if something goes wrong, you don't have the civil right for a a civil case to be heard by a jury. You've got to go to an arbitration. So if you've knowingly or unwittingly signed an arbitration ag- agreement, that what you've done is signed away your right to the Seventh Amendment. Arbitration clauses have almost become the standard fare now in most contracts. We don't need it anymore. The Eighth Amendment guarantees you the right to bail if you've ever been arrested, but bail violations are starting to pop up all over the country. Good example, what happened to a Utah man back in 2011. He had no prior convictions. Law enforcement kept him in prison because they couldn't verify that he was in the country legally. What? Notice they they didn't know if he was a citizen or not. He said he was. Uh, They didn't know. Just the mere speculation was enough to justify an indefinite detainment which lasted 39 days. He was granted no due process and no bail. Amendments 9 and 10... I mean, that's a safeguard for anything the framers might have forgotten about, really. What what they're saying here is there's other rights. It's not just these. There are other rights, and they're held by the people, not the government. And in number 10, there's other powers that the government has, but, but they're also kept by the states and the people. Let me just explain. There is no right to health care. There are powers of health care, but they're kept by the state. That's why you didn't hear any libertarian or anybody who believes in the Constitution cry out on Romney care up in Massachusetts. They belong to the state. That's not a right. That's a power. Obamacare blew both of these up the day it was signed into law. Nine and ten specifically designed for that kind of government overreach. But they were considered dead letters with a stroke of Obama's pen. He's got a phone. He's got a pen. And so do the last three presidents. Look at all of these. We are in serious violation of every single amendment, including the quartering of soldiers. You could make a case that the fourth, the ninth, and the tenth, and I say the third, are all but dead. The first, the second, the fifth, and the sixth are barely hanging on by a thread. We have to stop blaming because no matter who you pick in, this, wor- in this, this game of blame, you pick whoever you want. The one who the politicians will actually blame when they put in their government solution will be you. It might not be you this time, but it will be you next time. I've got rights, you know. No, no. Because Americans don't know their rights, 
because they can't, they can't even tell you the, the five rights in the First Amendment because we don't know them, they're going away. All of our problems, all of the confusion in our life is caused by the violation of the Bill of Rights. You want to know what brings us together? You want to know what light, left and right agree on? Those rights. Those rights. Perhaps with the exception of the Second Amendment. Can you give me eight out of the ten? Nine out of the ten? Because until we solve this, until we stop the violation of these things, nothing in America will be fixed. Because these are the things that made us stable. This is our unum. Learn them, or we will lose them. I can't wait to uh, join the uh, join the roundtable here in just a second. Um, but we ha we 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 have to learn this one lesson, and maybe this is not a big deal to you, but boy, it sure was an epiphany to me this week. That every time we blame one of these things, Wall Street, the banks, the, the banks, we blamed the banks. They, we said they have to do something. They're too big to fail. They did. Who's, who's losing their right? Do you know that the banks actually changed the legal language? You put your money into a bank. You are now the last creditor. You're the last person to get money. If that bank fails, if that bank doesn't owe you the money because you have it in there, you're the last one to get paid. <laughs> they are more than willing to do something. But they've been doing it to the average person. They're using it. If there is, God forbid, ever a coordinated attack on schools by, you know, some terror group, God help us all, because all of these will be gone, because we won't be strong enough to resist saying, yeah, but we've got to do something. And these things are the reason why the world is actually in the shape it is. And I mean the good shape that it's in. And I think that's probably what we're going to talk about a little bit on our program about the news and why it matters. <laughs>